4.5 stars, 259 reviews, QuickBooks apps. 4.8 stars, 863 reviews, Shopify app store. 5 stars, 456 reviews, Big Commerce app store. Finally, we have a real undo option. The solution is a game changer for anyone doing bookkeeping on the cloud. Jeannie Whitehouse, CPA and international keynote speaker. Knowing that any unwanted changes or transactions can be rewound back in time is a lifesaver. Kelly Parks, Calmwaters Cloud Accounting. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Rewind, later in the episode. So my, my big concern about accounting, it's not just about accounting. It's the whole concept of traditional education, going to a university and getting a four-year bachelor's degree and that preparing you for the world of work. I don't think that in general, universities are doing a good job of preparing anyone for the reality of work these days. For most careers, not just. Most careers, yeah. And and there's a whole new model of education where you can go online and you can get certifications and you can watch YouTube videos and you can learn a lot faster and you can learn stuff that is more relevant to what you need to actually do in the real world. And then we've got this other issue where technology is changing stuff so fast that the universities, the academic programs can't keep up because they move at a snail's pace compared to tech. Today is Saturday, November 20th. This is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Good morning, David. Good morning. I feel like it's a very uh, calm week. There's no travel. There's not too much chaos happening in our space. Thanksgiving's next week. Things are a little bit- Calming down. A little calm. But I mean, the whole, all this like infrastructure bill stuff passed. All the folks- But that's just the house, right? We still got- 12 weeks of media coverage before it gets to the Senate. That's true. Yeah. So actually, I was looking at all this coverage about what's in the bill and all this stuff. And I'm, there's really no point in analyzing it because it could all change and it probably will all change. So like, why even take the mental energy to worry about it? I do feel like though, every time they talk about it, the mainstream media always mentions the 80 million or the, the 80 billion for the IRS. Yeah. And that got some coverage this week. I'd like to talk about that. The CBO the Congressional Budget Office that makes these estimates of what stuff is going to cost or what it's going to deliver, said that the $80 billion isn't going to raise nearly as much as Democrats are saying. Investing in the IRS, we can talk about that. Also, um, something even more relevant to our show at the intersection of accounting and tech, you know that service Call NQ? Oh yeah, we talked about that about four episodes ago. So that has the attention of the Senate now. Basically the service where you pay them and they call and wait on hold for you. And the IRS and just clog up the IRS lines in theory. Yeah, there's a a letter. Four senators got together and wrote a letter to Commissioner Reddick criticizing the service. Oh, the letters. I love the letters. Uh, So we'll we'll get to that (laughs) letter. That's a good one. AICPA, NASBA, they published the revised CPA evolution model curriculum. That's good because I have questions on that. I saw the headline. Now that we've got this model curriculum, this is supposed to determine how accounting programs in colleges change what they teach to hopefully make what accountants are learning more relevant. And the CPA exam is changing to incorporate more technology. That's exciting for us in the accounting tech space. We'll see. We'll see. I, we'll talk about that later. Here's another one. Scammers cloned an executive's voice to steal $35 million from a bank. You've heard of deep fakes, right? So not just cloning invoices and the way people do this or, or cloning an email. Now they're cloning the voice of an executive. Because there is this tech now where if you have enough of a recording of somebody's voice, you can then create an AI model that will speak text that you type. I actually have this on my computer. I could use it for our podcast to make you say things, David, and people probably wouldn't even know. (laughs) I mean, you can tell if you listen closely. Anyway, they cloned this executive's voice and called up somebody and approved some sort of payment. So now we can't even trust the voices we hear on the phone. What else? What else? What do you got? We should talk about how Xero combined with QuickBooks and Sage and created a metaverse. I'm just kidding. That's my (laughs) bot. That's that's the AI you that just created some random sentence. We already had the uh, accounting metaverse episode last week. week. So you're not allowed to use the word metaverse for a while, David. It's it's, it's overplayed. (laughs) But if we had a bot, that's how the sentences would be. If you know, right, if, well, that would be it. if it was writing the copy, that's for sure. Um, pra- obviously, Intuit and Sage had earnings. We, we need oh, to talk about that. Intuit and Sage um, had earnings, yes. Uh, and Practice Signation raised a bunch of money. Yep, there's apps that raised some money. Um, but I don't know where you want to jump in. Do you want to uh, SPACs? There's news about SPACs. 
Maury statements, right? That's what yes. I saw the headline of. That doesn't surprise me. It all seemed like too good to be true. Probably creating a lot of work for these accounting firms that specialized in them. I don't know if the clients are going to be too happy about that. There's a billionaire. Well, I think they, 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 we should jump into that because okay, I could see where the clients are not happy. I know you've covered this before. There's a small percentage of firms that are doing most of the SPAC IPOs. Markham, I think, is the firm that did the most, or they audited the most SPAC IPOs. Right. I think a different set of firms help SPAC IPOs go public. Okay. And essentially, the firm, the accounting firms, what, what this is, is essentially there's two types of shares. There's class A shares, which means they're uh, redeemable, meaning investors can get their money back. Essentially, that's a lot of them, they want to go into a SPAC like that because they don't know which company's going public, so they're investing in the SPAC. And they want to get their money out. Oh, and and can I just step back for a second? For those yeah. who didn't, who aren't familiar, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. It's a shell company. You take the shell company public, and then it goes and buys a private company. It's a way to get around a lot of the red tape of a traditional IPO. That's basically why it exists. Yeah. Sorry, can please continue. Oh, no. and, and so the firms just considered the the differences in this and the errors were just fixable with a revision. And the SEC has came around now and said, no, that's not true. You need to file an 8K form. It's a, a big R being statement. Basically that the prior financial statements can't be relied on. And so, yeah, I guess if you were a company and this is your, you created the SPAC and you, or you, you hired these accounting firms to help you get through the SPAC process, you might be pissed. Yeah. Because <laughs> hundred, the, hundreds of restatements are coming. And there's a chart here in the Bloomberg tax article I saw showing how there were 349 restatements due to SPAC warrants, all other restatements 49 in 2021 after the April SEC announcement. In general, like, would you say that this is a versus other IPOs and other companies that, that this is a higher as a ratio? Yeah. I mean, the vast majority of restatements are due to SPAC warrant issues this year. Okay. Not great for the companies that chose to go this way. I'll let you well, go since, next. Well, since we're speaking of SEC government, let's talk about the tax thing. Let's talk about Call and Q. So Call and Q is that service that you pay for, pay a couple hundred bucks a month, and you get priority access to the IRS. Not not officially, but because Call and Q has built these bots that dial up the IRS and wait on hold for you. And then when you want to get on hold, you take their place in line. They're basically waiting in line for you. People do this all the time. It would be like hiring back in the old day of paper concert tickets. You'd pay homeless people to stand in line. Yeah. And I mean, this still happens. Like The iPhone. Uh, when the iPhone launches, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like there's services they'll do. So you can get a task rabbit. You can use the task rabbit app and hire somebody to wait in line for you. So this is the digital version of that. There's a blog post on proceduraltaxing.com about uh, this getting the attention of the Senate. People have been complaining about this in the tax world on Twitter. You know, it's it's a controversial service because even people who pay for it think it's wrong <laughs> in many cases. Basically, it makes other people wait in line longer, and it creates this cost that for what should be a free service, right? The IRS is supposed to serve all Americans or all taxpayers, and now you've got this like toll road. It, it would be like as if yeah, a private company- what if there company, three or four competitors doing this? I don't know. I haven't heard of any others, but yeah, it could jam up the lines basically. Like imagine you know, some private company figures out how to turn a regular lane on the freeway into a toll road. So that's basically what's happened here. It's gotten the attention of the Senate- Four senators, Senators Cassidy, Menendez, Young, and Warner, wrote a letter to Commissioner Reddick. I'll read some of this letter. Dear Commissioner Reddick, during the 2021 filing season, the IRS answered only 9% of incoming calls. We recognize that during this time, the IRS saw a record high number of callers and new challenges due to the coronavirus pandemic. However, the downward trend began prior to the pandemic. For example, the percentage of calls answered fell from 32% in 2018 to 21% in 2020. What's more, many callers wait on hold for hours only to ultimately see their calls dropped, an action the IRS calls a, quote, courtesy disconnect, unquote. Such a troubling approach to dealing with taxpayers is not in line with the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which makes clear that taxpayers have a right to quality service. Reasonable access to the IRS is essential to a fair and effective tax system. Media reports are drawing attention to a service known as NQ, which launched in 2016. Media reports, NQ, like, did these senators discover our podcast? NQ allows paid subscribers to jump to the front of the hold queue for the IRS phone lines. According to the company, this service reduces hold time for subscribers by up to 90%. So now this is an ad for NQ, I suppose. 
<laughs> Plans start at about $100 per month and run as much totally as $300 like per ad. month. This is horrible. Although helpful for those who subscribe, NQ's service creates a two-tiered system for taxpayers seeking to access assistance from the IRS. It also may exacerbate the poor response rates at the IRS it purports to address. It is curious that in the time period since NQ's robocalls began flooding the IRS lines, the downward trend in calls answered by the IRS increased so dramatically. As such, we ask that you evaluate whether NQ has negatively impacted the capacity of your phone systems. If it has, we ask that you consider all potentially applicable remedies, including 26 U.S. Code Section 7212, which prohibits attempts to interfere with administration of internal revenue laws. Being able to call the IRS is a free public service that should be available on an equal basis. Paying to receive preferential access to the IRS should not be permitted. Finally, we ask that you take necessary action to dramatically improve the quality of service called in for in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Hold time should be measured by minutes, not hours. The percentage of calls answered should be in the high double digits, not in the high single digits. Improving service should be an utmost priority to the IRS. Please keep us informed as you investigate this matter and consider your options. We stand by, ready to assist if needed. Thank you, and we look forward to your response. Sincerely, Senators Cassidy, Menendez, Young, and Warner. So here is my take on this. Two things. One, this is a very public like, hey, now that we're going to give you $80 billion, here's what you're going to spend it on. It's a very clear hammer on that. But the other Mm -hmm. part of this, it really smells like this is pushed by Colin Q. They've either (laughs) donated to these senators, they're pushing them to get the IRS to make Colin Q the official middleman. Because right now it's interfering. But if they get a nice official government contract and they get a chunk of that $8 billion, I mean, if you could get a piece of that $80 billion to be the call software in between the Uh IRS and the front end, the customers, I mean, us citizens, Uh it's worth buying off some senators. I, I think that's an interesting billion dollars. I think it's an interesting theory, but wouldn't it be a better solution to for the IRS to spend some money and invest in a callback system? But but read that letter. That that is a commercial. That is PR talk that was given to the senator for this letter. You think so? Oh, they, you called you said it was a commercial. So, it was so totally you're, a commercial. Your conspiracy theory is that Colin Q is paying off these they senators. Have a, they have a lobbyist pushing they're lobbying these. these senators, but they're criticizing Colin Q. You think this is like. At the same time, it was a commercial for Colin Q, right? (laughs) Well, that would be some crazy, brilliant marketing for sure, if that was the case. My theory is that people have been complaining to these senators. I mean, waiting on hold with the IRS is the worst thing about being a tax professional right now, I imagine. Could could it be any worse? I'd love to hear from our listeners. Colin Q should branch out and do this to every senator's phone lines as well. Oh, so that I could get a hold of a senator <laughs> by uh, w- by they paying. They should do the same thing. They should just block up all the senator and representatives' uh-huh. phone lines and run the same service for them. Yeah, so that's Colin Q. And and so you mentioned the eighty billion dollars the IRS is getting, which it looks like. Well, it hasn't gone through the Senate yet, but it looks like they're actually going to get it right. Or di- or did that actually pass? I can't remember. I don't even know where this legislation is. But there's some I eighty think billion it dollars passed the House, and now it's moving on to the Senate. You know, one of the controversies about this $80 billion is you know, whether or not it's actually going to generate more revenue, which to me seems like a stupid argument to be having because <laughs> we know that if we invest $80 billion, we're going to get it back. The question is how much more? The Congressional Budget Office is estimating that it will generate $150 billion, which is less than half of what the Treasury is saying. Treasury is saying if we invest... 80, we're going to get 480 billion. I was going to say, I thought I heard that on PR today. It was like 435 billion, 480 billion. Yeah. So 400 billion net, that's a pretty good ROI, right? The CBO came back and said when they evaluated this legislation that it would generate 150 billion, or I guess that's what it's going to come to. I'm not really quite clear where this is, but there's a debate as to whether that, what, what number is accurate. Nobody really knows. I think CBO is being conservative. Treasury is being more aggressive. The idea is that I think from, and I kind of buy this, the the argument Treasury is making is that when you increase audits and you on high net worth folks and businesses, you're going to increase voluntary compliance. I mean, the reason that we have such a tax gap right now is that the risk of an audit is extremely, extremely, extremely low. You can do all sorts of funny business. And if you get audited, well, the odds are low you're going to get audited. And if you do, you're going to get some inexperienced auditor and you're going to be able to 
walk circles around them or run circles around them, I should say. Yeah. I mean, I can't even believe that we're arguing as a society as to whether or not we should be auditing more than, you know, half a percent of businesses or something like that, half a percent of returns. It's just crazy. I don't know. That's my take on this. It's very clear that they want the money spent on telephone calls and call centers and not on auditors. Right. Do you want to jump into the revised curriculum? Yeah, we can talk about that. All right. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Center. Often when finance and accounting teams are asked what are some of the biggest challenges they face, you'll hear finding time for analysis and optimization, closing the books on time, and working more efficiently. One of the best ways to overcome those challenges is to lean on technology. Center is next-generation expense management software that makes it easy to automate expense tracking and save finance and accounting teams a huge amount of time. Center has the power and flexibility to adapt to your client's way of accounting for expenses. Think unlimited custom fields, projects, client names, classes, locations, and GL integrations like QuickBooks Online, Sage Intact, and NetSuite, eliminating those Excel pivot table hacks or repeated hours of manual coding. With Center, employees can easily submit expenses and receipts in real time and say goodbye to the monthly expense report. You'll see what has been purchased with Center as it happens, including unsubmitted expenses. You can even create workflows and rules to ensure compliance with company expense policies. To learn more about how Center can help you add more value to your clients, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash center. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-E-N-T-E-R. Center Expense Management. One solution, start to finish. So let's touch in before we jump into app news and all the other kind of stuff going on. The revised uh, CPA evolution model curriculum apparently mm. has been published again. It's newly revised. This is from the AICPA and NASBA. I think this is like the final, final, final. They've incorporated some feedback from users. Mm-hmm. And then they've also tied it to some surveys, I think. Yeah. And they've changed the model like diagram from this like, circles to a tree. So now you have, the, you have a foundation, which is like the ground, and then the core is the tree trunk, and then the three different specializations are uh, branches of the tree. So that must have taken a while. The way they're communicating about it has been changed and, and what it is. I, I guess for me, I don't feel like a lot of these articles have anything new, but there were some surveys. And they... Who did the survey? AICPA? Uh, so we conducted, would this be the Journal of Accountancy? I think it's the task force that's putting this together, right? That's what it's got to be. The CPA Evolution Group did a survey. So they said 83% of firms surveyed with 11 or more CPAs said that if university accounting programs were aligned with the CPA Evolution, their hiring of new graduates from accounting programs would likely increase. Accounting program graduates would be considered more valuable than they are today or both. I kind of want to call bullshit on that because <laughs> there's not enough accountants. They're going to hire anybody that gets an accounting degree, regardless if they get trained in the old school methods or the CPA evolution methods. Well, the problem right now- They don't have an option. They need the labor. They need bodies. Like, do you have a pulse? Did you take an accounting well, class? Maybe we'll hire you. I think what this relates to is the data point that CPA firms have been hiring fewer accounting grads and more IT and non-accounting grads over the years. So the the question is, how do we get CPA firms to hire more accounting grads to make the education more relevant to what they need to do, what they need to know in the the future or now even? I guess. But I also know like all I see is in my Facebook tweets and LinkedIn feeds and Twitter feeds, like everybody cannot find bodies. Well, you know who they can't find is the experienced people. Nobody wants to, well, so most firms are small and small firms do not want to hire grads, recent grads, because they have to train them and they don't have the bandwidth to train them. So the only firms that want to hire recent grads are larger firms, generally, the bigger ones. The bigger firms. And because they're doing doing consulting work and all this other stuff, they don't really want to hire accountants either. And they're hiring fewer of them because the skills they need to do this consulting stuff is not what is being taught in uh, the classroom. Yeah, there you go. And so this model is going to bring us closer, closer, theoretically. So it includes a lot of, well, it's supposed to basically include technology. And that is one of the three options. Section two that you can choose to specialize in is information systems and controls. 
So that includes IT governance risk assessment, performing procedures tests of internal controls, SOC engagements, use and management of data, and information security and protection of information assets. So you can choose to specialize in that now, as opposed to everybody studying all the same stuff. The thing is, the core of the CPA evolution model curriculum is still accounting and data analytics, audit and accounting information systems, and then tax. So basically, tax and audit get their own sections, and then uh, GAP. GAP has been supplemented with data analytics. And then there's a module. I'm just looking at the, the table of contents of the curriculum. They added a module at the end of each of these core sections called Digital Acumen, which is demonstrating the knowledge of and essential ability to respond to change in the world of digital tools and technologies. Estimated hours one to two. I guess those are credit hours. So it's kind of like tacking on a bit of digital stuff to the core, and then they have this new specialization in information systems. And I, I have to dig into it more. It's, it's hard to, you know, with all this stuff, it's so uh, general, it's hard to wrap your mind around what, what are they actually going to teach in the classroom? Versus if I just got my accounting degree with an MIS minor. Yeah, or just experience. So my, my big concern about accounting is kind of the, it's not just about accounting, it's the whole concept of traditional education, going to a university and getting a four-year bachelor's degree and that preparing you for the world of work. I don't think that in general, universities are doing a good job of preparing anyone for the reality of work these days. For most careers, not just. Most careers, yeah. And there's a whole new model of education where you can go online and you can get certifications and you can watch YouTube videos and you can learn a lot faster and you can learn stuff that is more relevant to what you need to actually do in the real world. And then we've got this other issue where technology is changing stuff so fast that the universities, the academic programs can't keep up because they move at a snail's pace compared to tech. So even if the universities do change their curriculum, it's not going to be fast enough. And what you learn in the classroom, as far as digital acumen, it's going to be like theoretical. My big problem with accounting education is it's way too theoretical in most cases. Now, I'm sure there's programs out there where you get real world experience and that's great. Those are probably the ones that are doing the best, but like most programs, it's all theoretical. And that's why accounting grads get out there and they get hired by these firms and they don't know anything. <laughs> they, they can't actually do anything. You can't put them down and you have to train them a ton because the university didn't train them to actually do the work. That's why they can't you know, pay them. So if a university doesn't, if these classes don't even exist yet, because basically it's, it's like looking at your college catalog, like I might take this class, here's the learning objective, here's how many credit hours it is. Um, and it suggests what courses I should possibly take prior to this course. If these are not currently being offered, and these courses have to be created from scratch, that means some professors are going to have to create textbooks from scratch. This is going to take like, years. Like, yeah, I was going to say, like, what kind of timeline is this on? I guess the CPA exam is changing in a couple of years. The new CPA exam, when does that come out? New CPA exam, 2024. So the new CPA exam starts in 2024. So theoretically, the universities have to like change the curriculum to match that sooner rather than later. Like, How useful is technology training that is theoretical and not practical? I would argue not that useful. The same thing as learning audit theory as opposed to actually doing audits. Yeah, like where's the course? A lot of colleges now have like entrepreneurship programs where you have to build and launch a business. That is really valuable. Like, like maybe that should be on the parallel here, because then you're gonna you're gonna touch all parts of the accounting stack. What What would be great is if the accounting department built their own firm and were offering services, accounting services, to businesses. Like that's what I would do. That's what I would create. And then you, as a student, could get education credit by working in that in-house accounting department. And that ties back to a couple episodes ago when we were talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and Talia S. West, and he made his students de draft the house, but then get, the, Build it. get their hands yeah. dirty and actually physically construct the house. Yeah. Yeah. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Rewind. As a listener of the Cloud Accounting Podcast, I'm sure you're familiar that Rewind has been successfully protecting thousands of small businesses, QuickBooks Online data from malicious attacks, buggy apps, bad data imports, and of course, ourselves. Human error, the number one reason people lose data. 
Backing up clients' data is a great idea for your clients. It protects them. But did you know that making backups of client data also helps protect your firm and lowers your fiduciary risk? Rewind makes restoring data easy too. You can restore an entire QuickBooks Online file or just one transaction. Rewind's copy feature can be used to copy essential data from one QuickBooks Online company file to another. No more starting clients from scratch. You can essentially restore a backup with your preferred chart of accounts and other lists into a new QBO file. Say goodbye to making manual copies of client files and CVS imports. Rewind offers you one login to access all your clients, the ability to manage your team with permissions and controls, and offers around-the-clock support. To learn even more about Rewind and access a special offer just for listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash rewind. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-W-I-N-D. Rewind. Protect your data. Protect your business. I don't know. It's, it's a nice looking tree. Looking at the tree. It would be, very, the, it would be a diagram. nice background on like your computer monitor as a wallpaper. I'm just looking at this and like, how do you get the universities on board? Like, how do you change all this? And then by the time it's done, is it already out of date? Yeah, I don't think universities are set up to move fast enough, most of them. Maybe I'll be proven wrong, but most of what I learned in accounting that was really valuable, I learned on the job, not in the classroom. The good courses that I took were the real core of accounting, you know, uh, accounting 101, 102, intermediate accounting, that theory you need. How much of this is just like personal responsibility? You you could do the old curriculum and become a CPA, but isn't on you to be like, hey, I should be more robust and take some MIS classes and maybe I should learn a little bit more business analysis and reporting and other classes on my own to supplement my CPA. You follow what I'm saying? Like, yeah. does this even have to be reinvented per se? Well, if you want the traditional pathway to stay relevant, right? The problem right now is that if you talk to a lot of firm owners, they'll say, if I have a CPA in front of me who went the traditional path, and then I have this non-traditional person who studied everything on their own, like what you're talking about, David, I'm going to go with the person who invested in learning technology and finance, and they know enough about accounting to be dangerous. That person is more useful to me in my firm these days than the traditional CPA grad. Because that CPA grad doesn't know anything practical. It's all theoretical. And even passing the exam doesn't actually guarantee that you can do anything. So this is kind of interesting. Just did some searches of the whole PDF. Mm -hmm. QuickBooks isn't in there. NetSuite's not in there. The word yeah. cloud's in there twice. That's it. Cloud? <laughs> so I'm. if somebody's going to go through this tree and come out on the other end, and they haven't taken a course on QuickBooks or Intact or NetSuite or Xero, are they being prepared? Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's the theoretical. There's all the theoretical stuff about data. And there's one section here about processing that actually kind of looked interesting. And this is in the specialization. The word automation is in here, robotic process automation, but it's in regards to audit and that's it. But these go. in there's theory would be the words that people are going to need to have skills around in the future. Cloud, automation, yeah. um, maybe crypto. Okay. So inside crypto's of the- Crypto's not even listed once. There's no crypto. There's no crypto. Inside, <laughs> inside of the IT specialization, there is a module called Use and Management of Data, and there is a topic called Data Preparation Manipulation. Here's a learning objective from that. This is 8 to 12 estimated hours. Is that credit hours or actual hours? Anyway, recall the capabilities needed in data extraction tools and the important considerations in making a data extraction request, such as the data source format and integrity of the data. Learning objective number two, describe key characteristics of a relational database. Three, explain considerations associated with loading data into the final target database. I mean, we're still talking about like databases. It just... At least spreadsheets in here nine times. Yeah. It's always done in the same context of appropriate technology, e.g. general ledger software, spreadsheet software slash application. Right. So they're leaving it up to the professors the educators to decide if they're going to actually use any technology tools in the classroom. But I've been in these classes, you always get some weird CD in the back of the book and it's some weird half-assed module that the professor had some grad students make that's not any actually application used in market. Sure, it does. Yeah. it's like an accounting application, but... Oh, I didn't even get any of those in my program. We were, we were doing diagrams that had tape drives in them 
we were drawing them with protractors and stuff. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Want to know something funny? So in the Journal of Accountancy article about this revised CPA evolution model curriculum, there is a list of the most common questions that AICPA and NASBA received as they released this. And the number one question or the first question listed is, is the CPA evolution model curriculum available in Excel format? That was the top request from faculty. It was to make the curriculum resource available in Excel format to help them map it to their own curricula. I just thought that was funny. Of course, the first question is, can I get it in Excel format? Yeah, it's funny that pivot table is not in here. They're not in there? No, but that's like one of the is most Excel, used things. You After search, you graduate, you kind of need to know how to do pivot tables, right? If you search Excel, does it come up? Excel's not in here. The word Excel is not in the model curriculum. I mean, yeah, apparently, from what I can tell, there's no branding, what? but I mean, the curriculum probably should have what? like, you need to take a course on. What about SAS? Is software oh, as a service or SAS, SAS. in there? Nope, phrase not found. Holy shit. <laughs> Sorry, you said cloud everybody. was in there twice? Cloud's in there. What twice. are the other terms that we use constantly in this space? I was searching for some of them. Excel, I searched for all the name brands, cloud. Is there um, anything for like SAS. how to run a practice? Oh, <laughs> API, how... API is not in there because it's part of the word capital. API is not in there as. What about like how to talk to a client? Is that in there? Like customer service? <laughs> yeah, right. That's not going to be in there. Let's just see the word client. There's something about liability. Okay, of course. I'm finding the word client in there at least a little bit like uh, individual tax planning. Soft skills. Identify data used to help clients establish their financial and tax goals. That's good. That's good. You know, something. Planning and communications with the client. Software is in here 26 times, but it's in. it's always in that same sentence, e.g. general ledger software, spreadsheet software, application. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no specified. I mean, but that there's makes no sense. course. It's- Business processes and controls describe the purposes of accounting financial reporting systems and related tools, but there's nothing like use the tools. <laughs> Just describe it. Yeah, right, right, exactly. What, you know what I would love to see as a learning objective or as a module or some sort of objective is by the end of your education, be able to run a full accounting cycle in some sort of accounting software. I don't care what it is. Just be able to do a full accounting cycle like you would do in corporate where you post the transactions, you look at the trial balance, you make adjustments, you do all the accruals and deferrals, you create a set of financial statements, you analyze them. Does anyone learn how to do that these days? Because that's what you actually need to be able to do as an accountant is close the books. There's these financial court, statements. Uh, you know, Calculating software costs and R&D costs for capitalizing that type of stuff. There's yeah. stuff on that. Oh, well. You know what? We'll dig into this. We'll need to look into it more. And I really want to have some folks on uh, my Earmark podcast, You know, my new show that I'm doing about this. Get some of the people on who created this and ask the questions because I don't know. We don't really know just looking at the document. And, and, and here's the reconciliation, right? Two weeks ago, I think I brought in that job posting from ProPublica. And they specifically called out Excel, QuickBooks, Expensify, and ADP. That's who they're trying to hire, somebody who has experience in those things. And none of this criteria trains you in any of those things. The specific tools. What about payroll? How do you run payroll? Payroll is five times in here. Um, But that's not in context there. It's just like as a, a step in a business process, it's not like how to run payroll. Yeah. And my focus is on, of course, the accounting services because I think that's what I did. But like in tax, I think it should be the same thing. Like one of the key objective of your tax courses should be at the end, your students can prepare a tax return, right? Shouldn't that be the point? Isn't that what we're preparing them to do is prepare tax returns, review tax returns for individuals, corporations, not-for-profits, whatever, like be able to do it. Yeah. Or if, if you are studying audit, be able to run an audit or- like manage one, right? Uh, Theoretically. Well, I think I understand all this now, right? <laughs> I was yeah. like, what are they launching? And now that we've dug into it, it feels like it's just, maybe it's not the answer. I don't know. Well, they're changing the theory, but it's still theoretical. It's not practical. And that's the problem. That it's just not practical enough. It's not useful. And this is why starting salaries for accountants are low because the skills we're teaching them in the school are not relevant to what the market wants. And so the market has priced the services accordingly. So- 
you got to make it more relevant, more practical, actually be able to do stuff. That's what I think. I mean, I'd love to hear from our listeners if they think something else. And, and, and the way the motivation is, in theory, if you're not going to be tested on the exam, your CPA exam, about QuickBooks or NetSuite or Excel or your knowledge of cloud or SaaS or any of these types of things, why right. would you take time to take classes about that and learn those when you when you really have to double down and only focus on passing the exam? Yeah, and that's the same way the accounting professors design their curriculum is to help people pass the CPA exam. Like that's what they teach to most of the time. So that's why it's so important. And that's what I'd love to see in the CPA exam is actually like do a return or do part of a return or do a financial close or audit a set of financial statements as the exercises that you do. The tree just needs one more branch. I'm just looking at it. It just needs a branch that just says some real world experience. <laughs> Functional, true experience. Like you actually use the apps. You actually create a return. You actually perform an audit. You actually, you know. Right. Run yeah. a small business, whatever it is, right? You are, you get in the weeds. You actually know it needs weeds. Like like it needs weeds. That's what this graphic needs. It it needs weeds, which is all oh, the real stuff. The real actual stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I like that because it's actually, a tree diagram. This up. So. If somebody has some Photoshop some skills, weeds. I'd love for you to add the weeds down below this tree, and that's all the real stuff. Well, hey, David, we we've we're beating uh, this up. Had, I know it's not too much time. We're beating this up. We need to do more. Go home and do more homework. Uh, let's talk about apps because that's the stuff we really know. Should we start out with uh, earnings announcements? Yeah, let's do it. What's uh, who, who who released their numbers? So Sage had their numbers out, and Intuit also had their numbers out this week. Sage, I, I kind of dug through the earnings call a little bit. So ultimately, it's the same trend they've seen before with Sage, right? Cloud native is growing. It grew uh, another uh, growth of 44%. It's up 26% from last year. Their focus remains growing the Sage business cloud. A lot of their growth, their high proportion of it is uh, significant levels of new customer acquisition. Plus, they're finally actually driving migrations to their cloud connected solutions. And so their revenue for, they kind of are tracking like something called to be migrated. And it actually decreased by 56 million pounds. So they're moving old desktop revenue, if you think about it that way, to their new mm -hmm. solutions. Um, the biggest one, obviously, is Sage Intact. Uh, it stands out as a performer. It's a uh, recurring revenue grew at 22%. So it continues to grow. And that's big because Intact's very expensive. So if it grows at 22%, that's a big number movement. The only other thing I picked up in there is they were very specific about Sage Intact, that they're talking about selling to CFOs. Yes, they're I like that. They're very focused on selling to CFOs understanding what causes CFOs work, the admin task in it, their team's problems. And that's why they're focusing on workflow, accounts payable, accounts receivable, mm -hmm. integrating payroll, HR, all of these things that are in bigger companies, right? So, th so it's very clear intact going not so much at accounts that listen to our show, but they're going really internal controllers, CFOs, they're really yep. targeting them because that's who, if they can convince that CFO, we're going to solve X problems for you. That's who's going to make the buy decisions. And this is a broad generalization, so take it for what it's worth. But I've always felt that NetSuite tends to sell to the CEO, the COO, whereas Sage Intact tends to sell to the CFO. That's always been a very different persona that they've had from a marketing standpoint. And I think we saw that actually when we interviewed the CFOs at uh, SuiteWorld. They didn't implement NetSuite. It was generally something that the operations folks, CEOs had done, chosen to do. Above, and they were above, using, yeah, above them. Yeah. Like right, which makes sense made. because NetSuite is a, they've got finance and accounting, and that's obviously important, core important, but it's like a business suite designed for the whole business. That's the starting point of it. You had more earnings though, right? Yeah, earnings Zero. number, QuickBooks had their earnings numbers, some oh, highlights QuickBooks, from there um, on Intuit's earnings calls. Just doing a quick search, like QuickBooks Live was only mentioned once, and there was really no context around it. It was just a word in a sentence, which previously... Mm -hmm. It was a lot heavier in these earnings calls, but these earnings calls now, all the attention is all the new business, credit karma, MailChimp, uh -huh. how these uh -huh. are integrating into the system. There was some stuff about QuickBooks Online. So QuickBooks Online advanced. It grew by 118,000 customers in fiscal year 2021, up 57%. Say so that number again. That's a lot. 118,000 new, new subscribers. QBO advanced subscriptions. In the, that's up, this year? This, up, in this... fiscal year 2021, up 57% okay. year over year. Wow. And they charge like 150 bucks a month for that. So that's a lot of revenue. Yeah. Which is why QuickBooks Online accounting revenue grew 32% in fiscal Q1. 
Um, it's really because of higher growth and higher effective prices and, and the, mm-hmm. the shift, right? And they continue to see as people move to online, the ecosystem, they use all the other services, payroll payments, capital, time tracking. That mm-hmm. grew another 42% because they're seeing this flywheel effect. Use one service, use the next service, that type of thing. There are some desktop information here. QuickBooks desktop enterprise revenue grew to high single digits driven by strong growth and price increases. So obviously they've been raising a lot of the prices on this and people still used it. They kept paying. In that same paragraph, they did talk about how they expect this quote unquote, we expect the desktop business to decline longer term. Well, it's good they're stating the obvious. They're stating the obvious. Stating the obvious. That's the way to do it. <laughs> One thing I was confused about is they talked about desktop and they've moved people from on desktop to this new subscription model. And yeah. essentially it's almost like 50-50 now. The uh the subscriber mix. They grew the subs, on, the subscriptions for the desktop product grew 48%, but the outright unit sales declined by 47%. Apparently, the way they're doing RevRec, the, to quote that says, it's, you get like an extra pop of revenue from subscriber both growth in the quarter. I don't understand how that works. It's like, can you count the SaaS revenue if they haven't, if they're paying now monthly? So normally when you convert a uh, transaction-based business to a subscription business in software, you take a hit on your earnings because instead of a bunch of people renewing at $3,000 you know, a pop all in that quarter, you get them switching to subscriptions. So now that's spread out over a 12-month period. So normally that would actually hurt you. I wonder if somehow the way they're doing it, they're getting people to pay yeah, I don't, I don't know. That doesn't well, I, quite I add think, up. I, I think with desktop, even though somebody would buy a desktop on January 1st for $300, that revenue had to be pushed out over the next months. Oh, it did already. I, I think okay. I, maybe that's why. So now what's happening is as soon as you, they subscribe, you get to book that month's revenue mm. now. Yeah, maybe they're accelerating it in the, like a very okay. short term okay. kind of thing, quarter to quarter. I don't know. We'd have to like actually know. <laughs> We'd have to see the spreadsheet. Yeah. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Client Hub. Do you struggle to get answers from clients? Is it a chore reminding your clients to send over the information you need to do your job? Introducing Client Hub, an award winning practice management solution for accountants looking to build better client relationships for a more profitable firm. Client Hub's all in one solution combines task management with client communication in one place meaning you get what you need from clients to unblock workflow and get jobs completed on time. Your clients will love the easy-to-use Client Hub web portal and mobile app. Your team will love Client Hub's automated task management. Each month, Client Hub tasks your clients with whatever you need from them. You can even automatically ask your clients about uncategorized QuickBooks transactions. Yes, you heard that right. Say goodbye to Excel exports and emails about uncategorized transactions. With Client Hub, tasks and messages are in one place, keeping your staff and clients always in the loop. Nothing falls through the cracks. Client Hub currently has an amazing offer. Black Friday through Cyber Monday, our listeners can get 75% off your first three months. To get this amazing discount, head over to clienthub.app. That is clienthub.app. This offer expires at midnight on November 29th, 2021, so don't delay. And then a lot of talk about mid-market. Um, they're talking about how with uh, QuickBooks Advanced, now they're really uh, going deeper in mid-market. They're really, this is where they're bringing in MailChimp. They think MailChimp's going to help them disrupt the mid-market. That's what the MailChimp is. It's mm. for going mid-market, making QuickBooks Online Advanced more robust. A couple of little small notes I noticed that were nuggets to take note of. They said that they, we call small mission-based teams that we are exploring other spaces because we can leverage a lot of capabilities of this virtual export platform. So virtual export platform, which is like TurboTax Live, QuickBooks Live, they have this platform now to mm-hmm. serve spaces like marketing and potentially spaces like financial services. Oh, so they could have like a marketing live inside of MailChimp. And exactly. You just get a and it's sounding like demand. on the personal finance side, the credit karma side, they you might be able to get some advisors. sort of financial live mm-hmm. type services. So they, it looks like they're yeah. doubling down on the live concept. And then there was an interesting uh, question brought up by uh, when the a- uh, analysts that were on the call. And it, they didn't really answer it or confirm it, but they must have said this somewhere else. He said, and I'll quote, 
I believe you called out the opportunity for QuickBooks payroll customers to deposit up to 232 billion of payroll funds into their Credit Karma money accounts. So remember, QuickBooks enabled that connection. If you open a bank account on Credit Karma, you yeah. can connect that directly to your QuickBooks payroll account. That's massive. If Intuit can move $232 billion from employees getting paychecks from banks and other places they send that money and put it into the Intuit bank, the Credit Karma bank, that's a pretty massive amount of assets. Well, because then they can take that money and they can loan it out to QuickBooks businesses. And Well, not only that, can... I think they're going to get into loans for consumers, right? Yeah. The Intuit bank has yeah. really arrived if, if they're going to be able to move that money around like that. That's a big deal. Yeah. And they just are siphoning it off just very easily, right? Yeah. With a click, switch banks. And obviously the street loved Intuit's numbers because the stock, I think it's almost $700 a share. It just, it moved almost $100 in yeah. the last day and a half. It's crazy. Well, this is a perfect tie-in to my updates for QuickBooks Online in November 2021 from the QuickBooks blog. Let's see what's new. There is now a MailChimp app for QuickBooks Online. It's a one-way sync that imports contacts and revenue data from QuickBooks into MailChimp. Currently in beta, the app is the first joint effort of QuickBooks and MailChimp with more to come. So if, I, if I'm MailChimp, it's my CRM. I've been sending out emails out of there. In theory, I'm going to be able to see the emails I sent to you, Blake, if they turned to revenue, not just if you clicked my emails. Here is the most confusing thing that I have seen in a long time. The QuickBooks Online Advanced app for Microsoft Windows is now available for download and includes feature and performance improvements. So David, QuickBooks Desktop is dying, but now we have QuickBooks Online Advanced for Windows. Essentially, it's a browser window, but yeah, it's not your so, browser. And right, it allows so, you to stay signed in. But the, the real magic of this is you can open up multiple um, entities at the same time. Which you can't do in your normal browser. You can, but you, you got to like set up Sandbox, not sandboxes, but yeah, yes, sandboxes. Different profiles. And, and profiles. And okay. a lot of accountants like this because you can have a couple of clients open at the same time, bounce around and stores your passwords. You don't have to keep logging in because it's, it's just once it's an app, it's a little bit more secure than just coming in from the web. So there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, and then apparently but the thing is, here's the thing though, is like, it looks like it's only available for QuickBooks Online Advanced. And they've changed this to a premium offering for Advanced. A free app I, is an add-on for QuickBooks Online Advanced users. Yeah. I'll also so go to my, using, my other computer not, and see if it still works. Yeah, oh, if you're not using QuickBooks crazy. Online Advanced, does the desktop app work? Well, I, that's the confusing thing because I have it installed on my computer for the regular QuickBooks Online. So I'm kind of, unless they've killed oh, that. It's confusing. Yeah. Call us, somebody. Let us know. Because <laughs> like, um, I hope they didn't do something like that. This is why people are, they're going to grow the hell out of the QuickBooks Online Advanced app because basically it's just going to be QuickBooks Online. <laughs> All the stuff that's great is yeah. just going to be put in that other app. Right. Last update, employee expense management. It's a new feature available only in QuickBooks Online Advanced. This is found under the bank slash receipts uh, or transactions windows. It's called employee expense management and allows employees to submit expenses directly to QuickBooks for the admin or bookkeeper to readily review and then reconcile into the books. Submitting expense reports and uploading receipts is now faster and easier than ever. So basically, all these expense apps are out there. Expensify just went public, blah, blah, blah. But now we've seen in the last, Zero launched it in their little payroll app, the ability for employees to submit expenses. We just saw Sage Intact launch this last mm -hmm. week or two weeks ago, and now QuickBooks is launching it. So is employee expense reimbursement just going to be a default function of accounting systems now? Right. And yet Expensify's stock popped 50%. <laughs> like it doesn't add up. Are people even going to need Expensify if all the GLs do this? I guess they'll do it kind of in a mediocre way and then people will buy Expensify because they need something better. I don't know. Well, it and I've always like... thought about that, Blake, about QuickBooks. Like it'll be just good enough, right? Yeah. If you, you have a restaurant and you have to do, you have a little bit of barbecue sauce, you need to ship and send. QuickBooks will do just good enough e-commerce to get you by. But if you have Omnichannel and you have all kinds of e-commerce and it's your real, you're just an e-commerce business. Maybe it's yeah. not gonna be the best fit for you doing that stuff through QuickBooks. But in this case, I think for somebody like me, I have an admin, couple receipts, this could be a good fit for me. I don't know. I'll have to try it. We'll have to leave it there. But I have to buy QuickBooks pra online advance first though. <laughs> yeah, right. this. Practice, practice. I'm going to start that again. Practice Ignition raised $50 million in a series C funding round Founded in 2013, 
Practice Ignition helps accountants and bookkeepers and others manage their clients with digital proposals, payment systems, and automated workflows. Currently, they support over 300,000 monthly client engagements. They've got offices in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. According to the story in accounting today, the company plans to use the money for product development and to fuel global expansion, particularly in the US, where it has strategic partnerships with Gusto and Intuit. They also plan to establish a new R&D team in Toronto. And what I like about this is the founder, Guy Pearson, he was an accountant. He had his own firm. I think he worked, I think he, right away, he, he worked for a big four maybe at one time, right? Or a top 10 Definitely firm. a big kind of hated firm, it, yeah. started his own firm and built these yep. processes and that led to the creation of Practice Ignition. Really awesome to see Practice Ignition doing this. And the opportunity is huge for them because they've always focused on accounting and they've had some people from outside accounting use Practice Ignition for proposals like other professional services firms, but they've never really marketed to them. But there's so much opportunity for them to expand to, I don't know, law firms or design agencies or any professional services business that has recurring engagements. That makes a lot of sense. So I think their growth potential is huge. Yeah. And paycheck. So, Go ahead. Oh, so there's a, another product that's not so much for firm management, but they actually offer kind of similar functionality per se. Uh, Formstack, they just took $425 million. It's a, they call it a, I think no code's the big buzzwords now, right? They say it's a no code platform to automate customer workflows and internal and internal workflows. You know, you have forms, right? You, you're onboarding for your client. They have forms. They uh, do documents, document signing uh, proposals, templates for that, and uh, compliance of them signing those forms. Mm -hmm. And it all connects through a workflow. Now, the thing is with this, it's probably, it's like more custom. You're going to build everything. And so if you're an accounting firm, you could possibly build on this, or like you said, you could just get price submission and it's kind of optimized for you. But it's, mm -hmm. price submission can expand out towards this direction, you know, as well. But that's yep. a lot of money, $425 million raise. <laughs> do you have any other app news? I do. Um, Paychex, payroll processor Paychex has added support for vaccination status tracking to its COVID-19 technology solutions. This is going to be really important because of that federal mandate now that employers with more than 100 employees track their employees' vaccination status and they have to either get vaccinated or get tested on a regular basis. So that is there. I think ADP did it first. I have a UK app and an Irish app that had raises. Let's hear it. Pixie, which is quote unquote, the operating system for small accounting firms, they uh, raised 2.25 million pounds to further their growth. Um, basically, they create a simpler approach for practice management and workflow automation for smaller firms. Apparently, they already have 1,100 accountants and bookkeepers around the world relying on Pixie. I always get this one confused every time I see it because they're similar color, but there's another app called Pixify, which is for its practice management for your professional photographer. So it's a very similar name. So I just get them confused because their colors are similar too. I, I actually thought the other company pivoted to accountants, but <laughs> that other company still exists. There's Pixify and there's Pixie. Out of Ireland, there's a company called Outmin, O-U-T-M-I-N. They were an Irish startup founded last year. They just took 650,000 pounds as, a, as their first raise. They want to double its headcount to 20. Essentially, what they want to do is they already have 60 clients, but for 99 pounds a month, the startup offers customers an accountant, a bookkeeper, accounting software, and it takes care of payroll, managing tax returns, compliance filings, and many other administrative services. Wait, wait. So how many clients do they have? 60. And they raised how much money? 650,000 pounds. <laughs> okay. Which is okay. not actually in the grand oh, scheme yeah, of the not... way the raises have been. It's not much. It's under no, a million bucks. It's funny right? they got it. Where did you find that press release? Is this it... is in SiliconRepublic.com. SiliconRepublic.com. Man, I've never even heard of some of these. Hey, I teased it at the uh, beginning of the episode, so I got to talk about it. Scammers clone execs voice steal $35 million from bank. This was on Newser.com. So apparently this was in the United Arab Emirates. According to a court document, investigators in Dubai say a bank manager, quote, received a phone call that claimed to be from the company headquarters. The caller sounded like the director of the company, so the branch manager believed the call was legitimate, unquote. The director told him that he needed $35 million to complete an acquisition, according to Forbes. 
The manager, who also received emails that appeared to be from the director and a lawyer he had been told was involved in the deal, authorized the transfers. So they spoofed emails. The hackers spoofed emails and they created a fake voice. They did it using deep voice technology. So this is the audio version of that deep fake technology where you can insert people's faces onto other people's bodies and make them say things they never said and all that kind of stuff. So another great reason to use approval software or approvals in your accounting software and not rely on informal verbal or email approvals. It's really got to be in a system if you want to stop it. They caught the guys. So that's how they found out about this or that's why this is coming out. There are apparently 17 known and unknown defendants in this case. Still a rare occurrence for this to happen, but we can anticipate that it'll become more common as the t- software becomes well, I mean, more widely we already available. have, like, I've been a victim of this where it is a text that's not the CEO sending me a text asking me to mm-hmm. you know, go buy gift cards and put them in a mailbox, like pick them up later type stuff. But yeah. they engage you those first two or three texts till you realize like it's a total scam. If you're not, pay- if you're not paying attention quickly, you assume that it's a real person texting you. So yeah, they're just yeah. taking that and moving it to voice. It's, just, it's the right. same game. It's just they're taking advantage of. And then the next thing will be is a fake Zoom call with fake video. Mm-hmm. Hey, you have a second to Zoom. They get on you. Hey, pay this bill. And you're not talking to that person. Um, you're right. Having approval processes and products could help this. But it's going to be where the, maybe people are going to have to have secret back channel apps they use to approve. Well, I mean, if you have the approval software secured by single sign-on and you're using, I, I don't know, you'd have to hack into that somehow and then make approvals. Yeah, it, it just makes the amount of work person. even harder, right? Right, and so you're not going to be that low-hanging fruit. Yeah. All right, David, that's all the time we have uh, for this We got week. a voicemail though, right? Oh, we got a voicemail. Let's listen to that. Here we go. Hi, guys. My name is Sabrina. I am a virtual controller and bookkeeping manager in Long Island, New York, and I'm calling because we were discuss- well, you guys were discussing in your podcast uh, what CPA firms are going to do in terms of being able to offer uh, bookkeeping options for their clients and that the CPA staff uh, is an issue, especially this year with all the staffing problems. Well, I work for a company that came up with a solution. You don't give bookkeeping work to CPAs. You hire professional bookkeepers. There is a slew of individuals who are running their own bookkeeping firms and there are people taking online courses every day to have this alternative and flexible career. I have quadrupled my business and my income and been able to staff uh, people who are working part-time and full-time to become bookkeepers under the umbrella of a CPA firm. Don't have CPAs do bookkeeping. They think in terms of tax returns, and they think in terms of certain projections. You want to hire a less expensive bookkeeper to keep up with the books. They can do it in real time with all the modern technologies, the mappings, the syncings, with all the wonderful apps that you guys are friends with the folks and support. And you can have real-time financials and information then we're going to lose that tax season and that burnout for CPAs where they don't enjoy their careers because they're so overwhelmed because they're not going to be doing full year write-ups and cleanups anymore. That's in the past. They got to go look towards the future. And I think for CPA firms, the future is with bookkeepers. Don't have CPAs do bookkeeping. Have bookkeepers do bookkeeping. They're less expensive. They are focused on those tasks, and then the CPAs can do what they do best. That's all. Thank you. Bye. But I like doing bookkeeping, David. Well, the good thing is she has nothing to worry about because the new CPA training doesn't train anybody to do bookkeeping. There you go. You're <laughs> you're safe. Don't worry about it. The, the whole new curriculum <laughs> is keeping CPAs from learning to do bookkeeping. So they will oh. have to hire bookkeepers. That, maybe that's the plus in all of this. Bookkeepers that's all the time. Of work we, work to do. we also have a review that slipped through. Um, oh, okay. Let's this. hear it. So this review, it's five stars. It's on iTunes. It, or, I'm sorry, on iTunes. It's called Apple Podcast now. You know, I'm dating myself. On Apple Podcast, here's a review. It's from KVS661. I started listening in 2019 and was immediately hooked. I sold my accounting 
firm in 2020 and still don't miss an episode, even though I'm not working at the moment. Blake and David keep us informed about so many new developments in the accounting world, and their editorial comments are helpful and entertaining. Having the links in the show notes is invaluable. I love the ads as much as I do the content because I like to hear about new tools and opportunities. As the content has helped me to advise my daughter, who is a college business major, about employment trends relevant to her future. One suggestion, if the advertisers would change their ad content more often, I would listen more closely as I tend to tune out the ones that I've heard before. The title of the review was Best Accounting Podcast Out There, Five Stars. So thank That's you, great. KVS661. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. David, if people want to get a hold of you, where do they go? I'm on all the socials, just at David Leary. I am at Blake T. Oliver. Reach out on Twitter. David, I'll talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Time for the classifieds. If you're looking to quickly grow a scalable, systematic seven-figure accounting firm without having to work 50 plus hours per week, check out Ryan Lozanis' online coaching membership, Future Firm Accelerate. Sign around Ryan's experience taking his cloud firm from scratch to sale so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll get online learning and topics that help you automate and systemize all aspects of your firm. You'll get coaching when you need help with implementation. And you'll also join a collaborative community of hundreds of other forward-thinking firm owners. For more details, head over to www.futurefirmaccelerate.com. Hey, podcast listeners. It's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud, and it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right, a true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble minded because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, listen to this show to learn what to watch out for and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.